imagine a future when the link between the cyber world and the physical world is real. When doctors work side by side with smart machines, so medical treatments will be delivered more precisely and safely than ever before. A future when autonomous systems pave the way for driverless cars, intelligent buildings, and smart cities. What would be possible if the boundaries between ideas and execution were broken? Here at the University of Virginia's Link Lab, researchers are answering that question. In this 17,000 square foot space, we are working together to develop the technologies that will shape society. We are not just reacting to the cyber age, we are catalyzing it. All of the grand challenges that we're facing as a society now and in the coming decades are going to require interdisciplinary approaches and solutions. When we first started envisioning the Link Lab, we had this idea of bringing together the cyber and the physical. And as we started having those conversations and we started understanding all of the exciting research opportunities at that link, and then all of the things we could do with that research, the different applications, the kind of societal impact we could have. It's the only place that I'm aware of that really integrates across so many different engineering disciplines. A lot of times these labs exist, but they don't reach across five disciplines and pull them in effectively like we're doing here in the Link Lab right now. Because of the multidisciplinary nature of the Link Lab, I get to work with faculty and students from uh, different disciplines. For example, I have students from mechanical engineering, computer engineering, and systems engineering. This helps us to solve problems with uh, complex challenges across different disciplines. Civil engineering is, is more of a traditional discipline we're one of the oldest engineering disciplines and what's interesting about us is that we're somewhat slow to change and the link lab in my opinion is, is really interesting because we have you know you could think of computer science being on the cutting edge of, of, of technology and so it allows us to, to really link up with people that are that are exploring new things like emerging data analytic techniques or uh, novel sensing techniques uh, and they're right down the hall. Being at UVA, it's a unique opportunity where we're, we're so closely aligned with the uh, engineering school to collaborate together between the engineering and the medicine faculty. So we'll have our residents uh, going over to the Link Lab, trying out the equipment to help develop it before we bring it over here to the operating room. Being close to UVA Medical School provides us with the opportunity to interact with the faculty and surgeons in a medical school and see the real impact of our research in either in simulation or actual practice. For example, we are working with Dr. Shankman on design of simulators that can help with uh, education and training of the residents in the operating room. I'm working with Lu Feng, a faculty in computer science, and we are trying to link our work uh, in autonomous driving and measuring trust in autonomous driving as well. So I am working on creating the user interfaces um, which can reside in the driving simulator that Lou has. With our approach and with our driving simulator, our lab setting, we're going to be able to test the design of autonomous cars in virtual environment. And this will help us to reduce the development cost for autonomous cars. And we can also design for more trustworthy and safe autonomy from the early design stage and also accounting for different human factors. So in the Link Lab, our research priorities are smart cities, smart health, and autonomous systems. But underneath each of those different application areas is cyber physical systems, which is the technology bedrock for all these different application domains that we're exploring within the lab. Cyber physical systems is a fairly new term, um, but it really links a lot of different people together. And so the, the, the opportunity to work with this, this group of, of researchers, researchers and students, who are sort of in this vested interest is, is actually very exciting. Health is not just something that is focused on by the medical school or the nursing school. When you think about the kinds of technologies now that can improve someone's health and wellness, or thinking about behaviors that end up impacting somebody's health, architectural spaces, sociological and psychological concerns that can affect people's health. As we approach those kinds of challenges in the coming decades, this is really gonna require teams of researchers from all of these disciplines coming together and finding integrated solutions. You know, my research centers on the, the, the built environment. And so I think for most people that, you know, things like buildings, bridges, uh, towers, things like that, uh, where we actually rely on it for our everyday 
lives. So the Ling Lab is actually really enticing to me because as a traditional structural engineer, we're looking for new techniques, new approaches, and new opportunities to do what we do better and understand the performance. I'm very excited about the university's investment within the Link Lab. Our new state-of-the-art space is really changing the way I think about my research. We have glass walls in our offices, which just makes you kind of look out and see the lab and want to collaborate with others and doesn't create this false barrier between faculty members and students. This is such an exciting time to be at the University of Virginia. With the level of investments that are being made in a variety of interdisciplinary activities, just the faculty and the students are energized. They see what's possible as we link across the various disciplines, not just within the engineering school, but across the entire university. This is something that's going to position UVA as a leader as it enters its third century. Humanity is at the beginning of an exciting new age, and UVA engineering is leading the way. We built a collaborative space where we are translating research into real-time technologies that will advance the world. We are making new connections and preparing the next generation of cyber leaders. UVA engineering is creating a powerful future. Collaboration. Innovation. Leadership. Research that benefits humanity. The cyber future is here. In the Link Lab. At UVA Engineering. If that doesn't get you excited about an engineering education, I don't know what would. <laughs> Welcome. I'm Craig Benson, Dean of Engineering here at UVA. Uh, I met many of you last night. Some are here new today. Welcome to everybody. Uh, we're glad to have you here. Uh, this is uh, the National Academy of Engineering's regional meeting that we're hosting. And this is actually a 20th anniversary of regional uh, meetings for the National Academy. And actually, the original idea for regional meetings came from Anita Jones and Bill Wolf. Anita, are you here? Ah, there she is. Um, Anita and Bill are both faculty in computer science uh, here at the University of Virginia and members of the National Academy. Very good to have you here today, Anita. It's just wonderful. Um, well, welcome. Just a, I want to invite or recognize a few folks from our leadership. Ram, I don't know if you made it today. We've got an NSF Engineering Research Center site review going on, so there's a lot of moving pieces. But our Vice President for Research, Malur Rama Subramanian, or also known as Ram, is here today on and off. So if you get a chance to meet Ram, uh, please say hello. He's a professor in mechanical engineering. Tom Katsalaeus, our provost, and professor of electrical and computer engineering. Tom's actually uh, stepping into a new role as president of the University of Connecticut here in a few weeks. Congratulations on that, Tom. Jim Ayler, Jim. My predecessor did wonderful things for the University of Virginia School of Engineering and Electrical Engineer as well. Um, and I want to thank all the Academy folks that are here today. We have a, a whole group of people from the Academy that have come down from Washington. Many of you uh, may not know this, but the Academy is all about service. It certainly is honorific that it's a great uh, op, uh, recognition to be inducted in the Academy, but the role of the Academy is to serve the nation. And the uh, members of the academy and the academy staff are here really for that purpose, to share what we're doing in engineering to move uh, the, the nation forward for the betterment of all. Uh, we have a, a great program today. Dan Moat from the academy is going to come up and speak in just a few minutes. But I think what this whole um, discussion today about cyber physical systems is where the frontier of technology is. Engineers have a special role today in our society. Very different than the role that I had when I was in school well, more than 30 years ago. It's hard to imagine that. Engineers were part of society back then. They were contributors. Today, they lead society. We had a really engaging discussion about this at breakfast this morning of the role of engineers in society as actually leaders, the folks that are driving the frontiers of our society and cre creating betterment for all. And I couldn't think of a better person to who embraces that idea than Dan Moat. So Dan, do you want to come up and say a few ideas? Dan's president of the National Academy. Craig, well, thank you very much for that, uh, that uh, very generous introduction. But thank you especially for putting on this regional meeting. 
this is a very, uh, a very special opportunity for us, and you and your team have really gone over the moon on putting this together. The amount of uh, attention you put to detail, the things you've done for us have been really exceptional. This is one of the best uh, put together regional meetings we've ever had. And I really want to thank uh, uh, Lisa Meadows and Elizabeth Mather for, for their work, because I know they did all the work and you were just taking all the credit. But uh, besides that, <laughs> and the rest of the team as well, everybody has put this together very, very well. So the critical organization, I have a number of people from the Academy are here, here with me today. I, I, won't, I won't announce them all to you, by the way, because they're, uh, uh, well, there's just lots of them. But, but uh, Al Romig is the executive officer. It's just one I will mention. Al, you're there. You might as well show, show your flag for that as well. Uh, these regional meetings actually are, uh, were created by Bill and Anita Wolf 20 years ago. Uh, and uh, they basically, the, the idea is to bring the Academy out to the membership and, and bring the membership to the academy at the same time. So we have about four or five of these a year. Every year they go to different parts of the country. And it's really a, a, a learning experience for us. And, and uh, basically it helps us plan our programs and, and get our messages out. We have a, essentially a meeting with members as well. So they're actually very, very uh, effective and, and helpful. I really want to thank the attendees very much for, for, for your, not only your attention, but your enthusiasm and your participation. We have an excellent uh, group of people here. This is one of the larger uh, assemblies of members who, and, and citizens who come to these meetings. We really appreciate it a lot. The, uh, the, uh, this year we've had the regional meetings at, at UT Austin and Agilent, in, former Hewlett Packard in, in, in the West Coast, and, uh, and Illinois Institute of Technology as well. So uh, the, uh, the, the topic, cyber physical systems, is, is extremely uh, an, an important topic. And I agree completely with what Craig said about its importance. And one thing you might think about a little bit is that we know we all live in a time of accelerating change. That's a com common thing that everybody's pretty much accepted. And, and, uh, and accelerating change, the part you may not have thought about is it's all about, ultimately, about engineering. All this accelerating change, all it does is create more opportunities and possibilities for engineering. That's why engineering is so much in demand all over the planet. Every country I go to, every company I go to, every university I go to is looking for engineers, as a matter of fact. It's probably the greatest time for engineering that I, in my lifetime. And, and it's all driven by this uh, accelerating change. And, and that because it's opening up opportunities. And the cyber physical systems discussions today will just be all about this accelerating change as a matter of fact as well. So it's a great topic. Uh, it's a great opportunity for us to, to hear the front edge that's going to be uh, not only today here at UVA, but also tomorrow here at UVA, where they put this together and the investment they've made in people and space and vision and having a leader like, like Craig that's so devoted to this as well. The, the situation is kind of just set up perfectly for a, a great success here at UVA in this topic area. So I, I thank you for having the regional meeting. I thank you very much for the work you're doing in advance. And I'm very much looking forward to the, the uh, regional meeting today. And I hope you all are as well. Thank you very much. Well, good morning, everyone. And as, as Craig said, uh, I'm former dean of engineering here. Uh, and he's uh, uh, done a great job here of taking the engineering school to, next, to the next level. I'm here uh, just to introduce you probably to something uh, that was fairly new called the Virginia Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. And on behalf of the Virginia Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, I want to welcome you to this exciting National Academy meeting. I am the president-elect of the, of the somewhat uh, new organization uh, and starting in July. And the, the current president is uh, Trish Dove from Virginia Tech and couldn't make it today. But also I want to, for the members of the uh, Virginia Academy that are here today, I want to thank you for everything you've done so far to help uh, uh, build this organization and, and really uh, move us forward. A little background uh, for those of you that may not be familiar with the Virginia Academy. The Virginia Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine was formed in 2013 
uh, under the urging of Senator Mark Warner. And the model that he has was something called TAMIS, the Texas uh, Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. The Virginia Academy is really modeled after the objectives of the national academies. Uh, its members, uh, it was established as a resource for the independent expertise to help the science and technology policy matters facing the Commonwealth of Virginia. Its membership includes all members of the three national academies, but it solicits others uh, to help in terms of areas that may not be covered by the members of, of the national academies. Its products uh, to date have been multiple annual summits on topics of particular interest to the state, such as global resi resilience, and a study on the help, health of the aerospace industry in the state. This material can be found on our website at vasem, V-A-S-E-M dot org. And if you have any interest in, in uh, being engaged with some of our activities, uh, please see me after the event. I'll get on our website. Again, welcome, and uh, thanks for coming to the University of Virginia. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Jack Stankovic, the VP of America Professor of Computer Science and also Director of the Link Lab. And before we get going, if you need a Wi-Fi, the instructions are on in the back of your tag. If you have any trouble with getting access to Wi-Fi, you can see people at the desk. Okay, so I'm honored to welcome everyone here to Rice Hall, and this is a computer science department. And later today, we'll be going over to the Link Lab which is next door. There are also demos we'll see downstairs on uh, different aspects of work going on. Uh, our goals for the Link Lab are to really have excellence in research and education. And in the research side, we're focused on smart cities, smart health, and autonomous systems. And on the education side, we just were awarded a $3 million grant from NSF to create a graduate education program in cyber physical systems. We believe it's the first such grant to focus an educational process in this area. Uh, we also believe that the construction of the Link Lab and the way it's built, where faculty from five departments have co-located in one spot, is also unique. Many other schools have virtual labs, in a sense. They have people from multiple departments working together, but no uh, co-located space. So, so that's uh, something that we're really proud of. And I also want to echo Dean Benson's remarks on thanking the National Academy for coming here and letting us uh, put on this event. So now I have the privilege of, in, of uh, welcoming uh, Vint Cerf, a, a star in computer science. He has so many amazing awards, I can't go through them all because we'll be here all day and have nothing Google else it. to do. They can, <laughs> they can Google it. Uh, but I do want to say a few things. So first, he, many of you know this, that he's uh, often considered the father of the internet, and uh, both for his TCP IP protocol d design and the architecture of the internet. Uh, amazingly, President Clinton <coughs> presented him the Medal of Technology. This is a, a, a you know, kind of national medal, along with Bob Kahn. And um, he, of course, won the Turing Award, which we often think of in computer science as a Nobel Prize, since Nobel Prize they don't give them for computer science. Um, then uh, in 2005, George Bush awarded both Vint and uh, Bob Kahn the Presidential Medal of Freedom, which is the highest honor from, from the government you can have. Uh, he's also won a Japan Prize, uh, the Queen Elizabeth Prize. He's an officer in the French Foreign Legion. Maybe you didn't know that one. And uh, he's in the British Royal Society also. Uh, and since about 2005, he's been a, a chief internet evangelist for, for Google. And I wanted to also say one or two things, as he's been a great friend of the Department of Computer Science here at UVA. And around 1998, 20 years ago or so, he was working at MCI, and they had all the routers for the internet, and they were upgrading them. And so he donated that, all those routers to our department, and we built a lab called Vint Lab. <laughs> all right? And it was in his honor, but it also st stood for virtual internet. 
and we could teach students on it. And Jörg Liebeher, who was here at the time, developed a class where students actually acted as internet engineers and were able to program and develop routing and other kinds of technologies that were on the internet. It's a great class, a great opportunity for, for the students. And I think that was also unique. We don't know of anywhere else that, that was able to do that. Um, and then secondly, about when the department had a 25th anniversary event was willing to come and he gave a, a keynote for, for our, uh, kind of our, our party that we were having in, in our own honor. And so without further ado, just let me please join me in welcoming Vincer. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for, uh, for joining us. This is an important kind of event for the National Academy and certainly for uh, the university here. These regional meetings, I think, are a very important opportunity for us to contemplate the effects of technology on our lives and the responsibilities that we have. And so if you uh, don't come away with anything else from my bit, please come away with a sense of deep responsibility to the society that is affected by the engineering, especially software and computer engineering, that pervades our lives today. You should go away, especially those of you who actually produce these devices and their software, with a real sense of responsibility to our society. Uh, I really appreciate the introduction. Of, of all the introductions I've had, that was the most recent. <laughs> <laughs> I stole that from somebody else, so I can. Uh, um, you know, I, I was thinking of, of the name of a link lab, and I was thinking if this was 1800, this, it would be a link lab uh, explaining how you make sausages or something like that. Uh, actually, you know the story about watching laws being made? It's like watching sausage being made. You, you don't want to know. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of hoping that the link lab will upend that view. We want people to understand how this technology is built, how it works. Uh, what its brittlenesses are, what its weaknesses are, and what its strengths are. Um, I also wanted to uh, acknowledge, uh, again, uh, Anita Jones and Bill Wolf for all their contributions, not only to UVA, but to the National Academy, and to the country's safety and security. So, Anita, thank you so much for coming today. Sigurd and I uh, had a lovely dinner last night with both of them. Uh, we had four bottles of wine on the table, shocking everyone else in the restaurant. We didn't actually get through more than one, but that was okay. Um, I also wanted to mention that I try to get to multiple universities when I can. So uh, yesterday morning, I was at uh, George Mason University uh, talking about uh, accessibility and writing software that makes computers more accessible. Uh, but the thing that struck me more than anything was uh, autonomous vehicles roaming around delivering food on the campus. There were dozens of them, and you know they just kind of buzz along. They can do it because the university there is fully accessible for wheelchairs, so these little vehicles follow the wheelchair routes. Uh, I was just waiting for one of them to come up to me and stop and say, take me to your leader. <laughs> Uh, it didn't, however. Uh, it ran over my toe instead. But. So uh, again, let's talk about ethics. Let's talk about computer science and what I'll call the Internet of Things, although cyber physical systems is as good a definition as any. But I want to caution you not to get too captured by the physical part here. Um, devices that are not physical are still robots. For example, a program trading system, in my view, is a robot because it takes information in from the real world, it does a computation, and it has an effect on the real world. It might be your bank account. And so I consider those artifacts, those software artifacts, to be as much ro a robot as any physical device. So I hope that you will keep a very broad uh, definition in your minds about these things. So let's start out uh, with what the users are expecting of us when we um, b build these devices and make them available. The first thing is that they expect them to work. I mean, they don't expect them not to work. And so one of our important uh, ambitions should be to make this true, that it just works. And they also expect any user interfaces for these things to be intuitive. Now, every single person in this room has experienced unintuitive interfaces. Some of you may even be responsible for producing them. 
And of course, because you're an engineer and you understand how it works, it's obvious what the user interface is trying to say, but not so much to uh, the rest of the world that is not part of the engineering profession. So we really have to think hard about how to make things intuitive. They also uh, expect, you can tell this is a pitch that I give to my engineers at Google when I speak about our products, I'm talking about Google's products in this space. They expect commonality to work. And in the broad sense, all of these devices, no matter who makes them, ought to be interoperable. We ought to be able to assemble devices from a wide range of sources and have them work together. Of course, the only way that's going to work is if we have common standards that we all agree to and adhere to and implement. It's also clear that they want this uh, series of desirable properties, safety, reliability, privacy, security, ease of use, and autonomy in a different sense than the little cars that are driving around. Imagine that you have a house full of these things and they're very much dependent on access to the internet and the internet access goes away and the house stops working. This is a bad design. The thing has to work or the things have to work no matter whether the internet's accessible or not. It may not be able to do everything. Maybe you will have trouble adding a new device until that internet connection comes back up. But you certainly don't want the system to stop working. Uh, they will be very quickly discarded if that were the case. And they certainly don't want to have a big debate about which light to turn on. Now, imagine, you know, you walk in and you say, turn the lights on, and it says, which one do you want me to turn on? Now, think about this room for a moment. There's an awful lot of lights in here. And if you said, turn the lights on, the system said, which one? How would you say that? You know, do you have to give them names like George and Frank and Eddie and say, turn Eddie on, turn George off? That might be doable, you might figure it out, except what if you have a guest who arrives and you have to give him, him or her a list of the names of all the light bulbs in the house. This is not the best interface in the world. We have to figure out how to do that. By the way, a simple solution to that might be a display where you just point to the thing that you want to turn on and it goes on. Or maybe somebody can invent a little you know, pointer thing that you can aim at the, whatever the device is you want to control and it wakes up and does the right thing. So in any case, uh, I want to argue that we should evaluate product offerings as the users see them, not as the engineers see them as, man, this is cool. Okay, the other thing we have to do is to be careful about oversimplifying models. Here's a typical example of what some engineers think in Internet of Things is about. It's about a device and a mobile and, and an app, end of story. Well, maybe the internet's hiding in there somewhere. But that's it. I mean, they just imagine there's just one person, one device, one app, and that's it. Well, that might work for one device. What if you have 100 devices in the house? And you have 100 different apps that you have to go through to figure out how to flush the toilet. I mean, you know, come on, let's get real about this. We have to build systems that we can uh, work with in a simple way. So it has to be seen as, a, as an ecosystem. Uh, there will be ensembles of devices in our world, and they will come from multiple brands. And so once again, we have to cater to that as we're thinking about designing and building these things. Uh, what about discovering that a new device has shown up? Under what circumstances should you add the device to your ecosystem or not? What if it's the repair guy who shows up with his mobile? You don't want the repair person to suddenly become a controller of your house. Although you might imagine having to give temporary access to control of some devices if that's what the repair person is there for. So we actually have to cater to a fairly complex environment of uh, access control, uh, granting and revoking uh, that access control. And so if a device shows up, we have to be actually fairly smart about whether it becomes a part of the ecosystem and for how long. What about software updates? You know, one of the uh, absolute essentials, in my view, for building devices of this kind is that their software can be revised. And the reason for that should be obvious to everyone in this room. So far as I can tell, over the last roughly 80 years of writing software, we haven't figured out how to write software that has no bugs. The implication of that is that there will be bugs. 
the further implication of that is that we have to find a way to fix the bugs. Well, okay, that's cool. You can figure out how to get the device to download a new program. However, you want to make sure that the program is the right one to be downloaded into that device. Uh, first question, is it coming from the source that the device should recognize as authoritative? Wouldn't you like some strong authentication about that point to make sure the device knows where it should get its new software from? Second, you want to make sure that somehow that software hasn't been altered on its, on its journey from the source to the device that's uploading it. So we need digital signatures, hash codes, you know, uh, cryptographic hash codes and things like that to make sure that nothing has been changed. Uh, if the device is going to export information, you want to make sure it knows it's exporting it to a legitimate and authoritative destination and not someplace else. There's another little issue, and that is that not all updates work. I'm sure no one in this room has ever had that problem, but uh, this morning I was briefly terrified that, uh, that my machine had stopped working because I haven't uh, upgraded to Mojave on my uh, Mac OS, and I'm nervous about it because my staff said certain things that we rely on aren't working anymore after that. So I refused to upgrade to Mojave in the machine uh, looked like it was about to do it on its own because at Google they insisted we had to do the upgrade. So I was in a mild panic this morning that I couldn't get my slides up. Uh, in any case, we want to make sure that if you do an update, there's a way to get back to a known state if you're in trouble. Those are little details that engineers should be paying attention to because the users of these devices will not be able to recover on their own if we haven't thought through those scenarios and provided for them in the design. And along those same lines, uh, we should be able to instrument these devices so we can keep track of whether they are working properly, how well they are working, how well they are used, are, are they efficient, are they doing the right thing, even if the users don't report to us their problems, we'd like to be able to discover them if we can, even before they do, and try to do something about it. I am very conscious of the fact that a lot of these requirements uh, might not be implementable in some of the devices that we have chosen to program, like a light bulb, for example. And the reasons for this might just have to do with cost. It might be that we can't put a, a powerful enough uh, programming device, programmable device into this small device to make it cost effective even though we want the ability to do the control. That leads me to believe that architecturally we might want a hub-like device, a central device that's part of a residential setting or uh, certainly an industrial setting that uh, provides for uh, additional access control, for example, uh, could defend against an attempt to get control over those devices. This is actually a very real problem. Some of you who are following uh, this space will remember that uh, something like a half a million webcams were formed into a botnet because they had no access controls. Or if they did, the access controls were well known because it was a well known and unchangeable password to get control over that webcam. So this half million webcams were formed into a botnet. Uh, their megabit per second streams were targeted at Dyn Corporation and knocked it over with a 500 gigabit per second attack. And the problem with that one is that it had a cascading effect because Dyn Corporation was also doing domain name resolution for a number of important companies, and so they disappeared from the internet with regard to domain name resolution in a consequence of that attack. Uh, so uh, here's a, an example of a case that we want to make sure that these devices that are not adequately protected have a second line of defense, and so this hub or firewall could be part of that story. There are other desirable properties that we should be thinking about in this space of products. For example, um, it has to scale. It's one thing to install one device, you know, you turn your app on, you do a little Bluetooth thing back and forth, the device is part of your control, done. What if you have 100 devices? The last thing in the world you want to do is type a bunch of IPv6 addresses into, you know, for 100 devices. And, and then what if you have a house that's got 100 of these things and you move to another house that has another 100 of them, so now you get 200 devices to configure? The last thing in the world you want is, you know, this. 
So we have to think our way through about making the system scale up. It gets worse if you're doing industrial settings where there are tens of thousands of devices like this in a manufacturing plant, for instance. Um, now we have another little problem. Uh, back to this oversimplified model. Uh, if you think about the design for one person is control of that device, end of story. Now you have a house full of people. And maybe you want to distinguish between the parents and the kids. It might be that you don't want the kids to be able to do some things that you want to do, like keep the house locked and the kids want to unlock it or get access to things that you don't want them to get access to. How does the device distinguish the various parties and their authorities? Uh, speech recognition is eh, not perfect. Uh, facial recognition is not perfect. It's not 100% clear what the right solution is here, but we have to be able to make those distinctions. I mean, I hope we don't have to glue a little RFID tag on your forehead in order to make that work. Probably doesn't, uh, doesn't go over well. Uh, but it, that's just the beginning of the problem. What if you have guests? Guests come over. Um, you, uh, you need to introduce them to the house. So uh, how do you do that, especially if it's a voice-activated house? So do you have the guests read this thing you know, before they can do anything else, they have to read this list of words or other things so the house can learn how they say stuff. Um, and then how do you undo that when they leave so that they don't retain control over the house when they go away? Uh, think about this. This is, this is kind of weird stuff. Uh, we have to deal with that. You know, what if they're overnight guests? You know, what if they stay for a week? Uh, what, what if you want to have control of the house when you go away, but you don't want any of your guests to be able to do that when they go away? Um, what about emergency responders? When they show up, you may very much want them to have access to the control of the house under, under certain conditions. So um, you know, exactly how do you do that? How do you grant access? How do you rescind it? When do you rescind it? What are the mechanics of all that? This is a non-trivial problem, and it takes some serious thought. And so I hope I, I you know, hit you over the head pretty hard on this one because it's so easy to do some trivial design that just that works, but it doesn't take into account any of these very real complexities. Think about the emergency response case. The house is on fire. The sensory system has de de detected this. The uh, fire uh, department is on its way. Your house has a bunch of webcams. Under the circumstance that the house is on fire, you want the fire department to have access to the webcams because they can see where is the fire, where is it burning, most uh, severely, are there any unconscious people and what rooms are they in? So under that condition, you want them to have access, but when the fire is out, you don't want them to have access anymore. And before there's a fire, you don't want them to have access. Either is the same argument for the police department or uh, health responders and the like. So how do we do that? How do we grant authority to people under these various conditions? We have to solve that problem. Um, how hard is it to add a new user of the system, how hard is it to drop one? I mean, do you have to have people go through, it's like a debriefing when you get a security clearance. I mean, how formal is this process going to be? Um, now let's imagine that you decide to give one of these devices to somebody else. How do you make sure that this doesn't accidentally give control of your house to the person you gave the device to? So how do you undo all this? You know, what's the factory reset look like? Um, how do we make that simple and straightforward? Uh, and what happens when a new person moves in and takes over the entire house or factory or what have you? Uh, how do you transfer authority? But now you want to think a little bit about what stuff does the house contain that you don't want the new owner to have? What about, you know, back, backup videos of, well, the webcams and so on? So how do you undo all that but still make it easy to hand over the control? So I hope this is giving you a sense for how hard this problem is and how complex it is and how important it is to figure out how to solve it. Now, we're going to hear more about security because we have a panel coming up after my talk, but uh, I have to tell you that, uh, that I think security is uh, very high on my list of desirable properties for this space. All you have to do is look at the headlines. I used to tell a joke, I thought, uh, that the thing I worried most about in IOT was 100,000 refrigerators attack Bank of America. Except that's not a joke anymore. I mean, given the DynCorp thing, 
Uh, but think about that particular scenario. Somebody decides that they can take over the control of every refrigerator made uh, by a certain brand with, of a certain model because there's some weakness in it. Uh, and then they actually make a botnet that does attack Bank of America. And the thing is that you won't know that. I mean, all the rest of the software is still working. The ice cream isn't melting, you know, your vegetables stay fresh. So you can't actually tell that it's part of a botnet. And even, you know, if it's sending email out at once every two or three seconds, you'd never notice that. It's just that there are 100,000 of them doing it, and it's, you know, wiping out the, the target. So I actually went to Google and I said, you know, we have this famous operating system called Android. Why don't we rename it Paranoid? To, to convey, you know, the point that it's really worried about that stuff. And the marketing people said, you know, that was... <laughs> so, so that didn't work. Um, firewalls and filtering hubs and things like that, I think, are really important for defenseless devices, like the little light bulbs that I mentioned earlier. And so, uh, again, that should be, I think, part of the spectrum of architecture that we develop. Interestingly enough, firewalls were not originally part of the Internet design. When uh, Bob Kahn and I were doing this original work, our first premise was that everything should be able to talk to everything else because we didn't know what applications would be required in the command and control space that the Internet was originally intended to satisfy. So we said everything needs to have the possibility of talking to everything else. But there was a direct implication of that, which is that that meant uh, you didn't necessarily have to talk to anybody you didn't want to talk to. But the decision was at the edges of the net. And so we assumed that every computer at the edges of the net would decide whether it wanted to or didn't want to talk to something. And it could say, no, I won't talk to you because you haven't validated yourself to me. Well, that made sense when the computers were large-scale time-shared computers in air-conditioned rooms. That's 1973. Today, it's sitting in your pocket, and it's in a light bulb. And so the notion of end, uh, edge defense may no longer be a supportable architecture, and we need these intermediary middle boxes in order to help. Uh, I'm a huge fan of strong authentication, by which I generally mean public key crypto, uh, two-factor authentication, uh, you know, the public and private keys that are associated with the device upon its uh, activation. So that the device has a public and private key pair, it can exhibit its public key, you can send to it commands or requests that are encrypted, so you're, you're hiding um, the data. By the way, uh, this information hiding uh, point is, uh, is important, and I can't remember whether I have another slide that's related to it, but I'll tell you now, and if later it pops up, we'll just skip over it. But think about the information that you might want to protect. Yes, you want to protect the video from the webcam. That's pretty obvious. You might want to protect phone calls that you make. But imagine that you have sensors in the house, like I do, that have temperature information. Every five minutes, I have a little sensor in every room in the house that records the temperature, humidity, and light level and sends it to, uh, through a little mesh radio network to a server down in the basement. And over the course of a year, I collect all this information, which tells me how well the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system worked. I mean, it's engineering data, and so that lets me adjust the system uh, at the end of the year based on experience. Well, it turns out I would not want that temperature information to be available to a third party. And you know, your first reaction is, are you paranoid? You know, I said, no, I'm not. Um, the point is that if you have enough of that data, you begin to infer from it what are the diurnal patterns of that house. Who comes and goes? When do they come and go? Which rooms do they occupy? You know, when did the, you know, the garage warm up because the car came in? Except it doesn't when our Tesla shows up because they don't produce the same heat level that the other cars do. Ha <laughs> ha. So um, in any case, I consider that information to be a, at risk, and so it needs to be encrypted, and I want control over where it goes and who has access to it. So even innocuous stuff like that is a big issue. So I believe very strongly in you know, using these uh, public key crypto ideas. For those of you who are tracking, of course, we have quantum computing coming along, and that may disrupt the current uh, algorithms for public key cryptography. By good fortune, uh, Lattice Mathematics and some other branches of math will give us some new problems to solve that will help us do crypto in the post-quantum, post-shore algorithm space. So I'm feeling, I, I won't say I'm feeling comfortable, but I, I will say that I am feeling like we have a path forward uh, after the quantum uh, uh, disaster uh, occurs. 
so, and, and I have to say that, uh, that although that's not our purpose at Google, we are developing very, very powerful quantum capability. There's a 72 qubit system, which is now in operation out in our Santa Barbara uh, facility. Uh, our interest, of course, is in finding ways to uh, solve really hard optimization problems faster than we can uh, with conventional methods, but those same pieces of hardware could conceivably run uh, Shor's algorithm as well. And the last point about security here is uh, how do we recover from uh, a security uh, disaster, an attack of some sort? We may want to go all the way back to a massive reset uh, to, uh, to clear all possible uh, malware that might have shown up in the system. But you might also want to be able to cache the configuration of this complex system of 200 devices so that you can reload a cache from a safe uh, source and reconstruct the system without whatever malware may have invaded it. And I'm sure you can add more uh, to this list, but it, security has to be a super high priority in the development of these technologies. The thing I want to uh, emphasize is that we don't always recognize the nature of the security risks uh, ahead of time. And I don't mean just the uh, exploits because we made a bug somewhere. We may not recognize, like the temperature thing, that there is a risk factor that we hadn't thought about. So this, I build this as, uh, as an ethical uh, discussion, and so this is where we try to get into that. Uh, one question is whether the maker of these devices is committed to maintaining them for the lifetime of the device. Some of these devices may have very long natural lifetimes. If it's a heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system, those typically last at least 10 years. Uh, other kinds of sensor systems have similar sorts of profiles. And so you would not expect, as, uh, as the acquirer of these things, to have to replace them every six months or every three months or every year or something like that. The more important um, point is that you would also not expect that somebody will take your money sell you the device and say, sayonara, good luck, and then never hear from them again. Uh, and there are unscrupulous companies that will take your money and then refuse to have anything to do with you. If there are bugs that are found, they don't to care to update anything. Uh, they just ignore the problem. That's not OK. That's unethical. And maybe someday it will be illegal. But at the very least, it's unethical. And so I think people who build these devices should have this commitment to maintain them uh, over the lifetime of the device. And in the event that, uh, that the uh, company fails, which can happen, astonishingly, right? um, then there ought to be provision for the source code to be made available for some third party to come along and continue the maintenance. Uh, another thing, of course, is that we should be committed to paying attention to vulnerabilities and mistakes, uh, errors that, uh, that allow other people to attack the software. Uh, at Google, we have a very uh, active team of people that analyze the source code that goes into our products, including our uh, IoT devices, looking for stupid mistakes. And I don't know about any of you, but I used to make a living writing software. And I have a little dent in my forehead from the many times I've gone, God, that was stupid because I did a buffer overflow, or I had an off by one bug, or I referred to a variable that hadn't been set. You know, So I did a branch conditional on it, and I went off to some place in, you know, in random direction, uh, leading to you know, malfunctions. So the problem is we do make mistakes, and so we should be uh, doing everything we can to build software production environments that help detect some of these mistakes. I, mean, I, I sort of want this little thing sitting on my shoulder at, while I'm programming and you know, having it say, uh, you just made a buffer overflow. What do you mean I made a buffer overflow? He says, well, look at line number 123. Oh, you know, several bad words. So we ha have not done a very good job of designing and building software development environments that have those properties. And I challenge the people in computer science to do that because there is going to be trillions of lines of code out there that we rely on. We need to deal with that. Uh, with regard to external attacks, again, full commitment to coping with them somehow. Even if you can't literally cope with the external attack within the framework of the software you're developing, 
you might have to say, this software should only be used within a certain framework. So do not use this unless you also do that. And I think this uh, is, a, is a vital recognition. Privacy, of course, has been a huge issue. Um, and it continues to be and will be a huge issue, especially in this environment. So I want to take you way back to 1900 for just a moment to give you a sense for the notion of privacy back then. Um, there was a, a little uh, box camera that was made by Kodak way around 1900 or so. And uh, it was one of the first small portable things as opposed to you know, those great big cameras with the black uh, veil and, and the big glass plates and all the other stuff. So these little, um, little cameras were uh, very popular. And then there were newspaper headlines saying, shocking use of these box cameras. They were taking pictures of people on the beaches in their bathing costumes. Does anybody remember what a bathing costume looked like in 1900? You went from here all the way down to the ankle. I mean, shocking. So, uh, so here we are today. Everybody is running around with a high and higher resolution camera. The camera is your mobile. Your mobile has radios, plural, in it, has the ability to upload this stuff to the internet. And guess what? We upload these things by the trillions all the time. We take pictures of anything that we think is interesting. And we happen to catch pictures of people that we don't know in those pictures. And we put them up on the net. And, you know, it seems innocent, doesn't it? Until somebody else is, you know, you know, going around looking for pictures of something. Maybe it's the buildings here at the university because they're classic architecture. And then they see a picture of somebody they know. And the picture is dated, and it says, here's the location. And that particular person told you they were in Washington that day, but now we discover they're here on the UVA campus. What could possibly go wrong? So our ability to deal with privacy is diminishing over time thanks to the technology that we're developing. So I don't have a, a good answer to that, uh, although I have to say I was just given a little gadget on my laptop that slides over the video camera. And it didn't occur to me to do that until somebody showed me, you know, I forget whether it was Steve Jobs or somebody else had stuck a piece of tape, maybe it was Zuckerberg, but anyway, he stuck a piece of tape over that. So we have to think about this. It's not going to be easy uh, to, to try to preserve the notion of privacy. In fact, I took the view at one point where I thought that um, it, it might be that privacy was an anomaly. I used to live in a little town in Germany in 1962. It was called Beutelsbach. It's about 30 miles from Stuttgart. And um, this town had 3,000 people in it, and there really wasn't any privacy at all. For one thing, back then, people didn't have their own telephones. You had to go to the post office to make a phone call. And the way it worked is the postmaster placed the call for you and then sent you to booth number two or booth number three. So the postmaster was seeing all the mail going back and forth and the postcards and making the phone calls. He knew what was going on in town. So did everybody else. So I'm, sometimes I think that the notion of privacy has been conflated with anonymity that you think you have when you're in the big city. Well, you may feel anonymous, but as we found out, uh, just the scenario I just offered, I mean, maybe you're not. So don't confuse an anonymity with privacy. Um, the ease of use point I made repeatedly, so I won't keep beating you over the head with that. I do think, however, that the notion of source code escrow is really important. There should be, uh, in my view, provision for the possibility that you've decided to sunset support for a product in which case I think there should be an obligation to make it possible for that product to be supported by a third party, in which case the source code should be available. There will be a lot of fights uh, about intellectual property, patented software, which is a bad idea, but unfortunately it's with us thanks to some judge. If, if I could go back in time, no, no, I don't want to go there. I'm on camera here. So um, the point I want to make here is that we need to make provision for continued support even if there are good business reasons for the originating party to say, I'm not going to do that anymore. Standards turn out to be absolutely vital. And of course, at the National Academy, uh, this is an important part of our lives because engineering and standards are what make things work and interwork. Uh, so 
One thing that uh, you can imagine having is a widely known uh, ontology of commands so that anyone who makes a device could either make use of an existing ontology of commands and responses or could uh, incorporate new ones into a commonly held schema, so, or scheme, I guess, uh, that, uh, that others could make use of. And so again, trying to introduce commonality across a wide range of devices that are being built and made. Similarly, common protocols, which again, uh, contributes to creating an ecosystem that has interoperability in it. Uh, certainly the internet uh, example seems like a good one. There are a lot of protocols, literally hundreds of them that are part of the internet environment, but the fact that they all are uh, adopted and used means that when you plug in to the internet somewhere on the Wi-Fi or an ethernet or something else, you have the ability to interact with literally billions of devices around the world because of this common adoption. So I think that's an important tool. I also believe that it's very important to instrument these devices and again, to do so in a standard way. That means that if you decided to build a system to manage multiple devices and to gather performance data, that, uh, that you know, we would have a common set, a common language for instrumenting the devices and getting data back. And that will allow us to make use of these things in, in uh, an ecosystem with uh, common uh, statistical data to help us understand whether it's functioning the way we expect it to. I've already pointed out the interoperation point. And finally, we should have common security protocols so we don't end up with a different security regime for every single brand of device that shows up. We really need to adopt these common strong authentication mechanisms with similar uh, design. And oh, by the way, those need to be updatable. Uh, you remember the DES standard from NIST uh, with the 56-bit key was very quickly overtaken and we eventually went through a series. Now we have AES and someday that too will also be inadequate and we'll have to have something else. So whatever we do, we have to make sure that the security mechanisms can be up upgraded over time. So I think this is my last slide. There's the bottom line here is that we're going to put billions of these devices to work, which means we will be foisting on the, the rest of the world the devices and software and systems uh, that, uh, that we built, and we should feel this big responsibility to make sure that they have all the characteristics that we've been talking about. We know that some of them will not be adequately supported after installation. I mean, it's just, um, we have plenty of examples of that. Some business, businesses are unethical in that regard. So we have to think about how to help users protect themselves against that. They should be able to ask questions. Maybe we have to have evaluation, like you know, an underwriter's lab worries about, is it safe in an electrical sense? Do we have other labs that we should have that will uh, evaluate these IoT or cyber physical systems and warn users against some that don't have adequate properties? Some of them won't be as reliable as we would like or safe as we like. Uh, or protect our privacy. And again, a, uh, a kind of a regulatory regime here might be uh, needed in, and places to evaluate the software. You can even imagine somebody deliberately offering uh, source code under an, an NDA for evaluation so as to say, I, no, I took this action in order to do the best I could to protect the users of this equipment from mistakes that I might have made in the software. And you, you, know, you get a check mark for that. Um, I think that uh, there are going to be a whole bunch of new jobs that show up as a result of these things. Not everyone is going to want to worry about configuring dozens of devices in the house, and so you're very likely to hire somebody to do that. Uh, you notice the ethical position that the party would have. If somebody comes in and configures all this stuff, you have to trust them not to configure it in such a way that they can invade your house and take advantage of it. And so uh, now we start thinking in background of licensing kinds of things and uh, regulations uh, that require you to uh, ob obligate you to certain uh, ethical standards. Uh, so my sense right now is that there is going to be plenty of new work created by all these devices. The makers of the devices, the programmers for them, the installers, the configurers, uh, the people who debug problems and fix them. Uh, that will, by the way, require new training. 
And so this is a classic example of how technology might destroy old jobs because these devices do things that we used to do by hand, but it also creates new jobs to cope with the effects of those devices. The issue is that if you lost your, your job because that's been automated away, uh, how do we train you to do the new jobs? And so the role of universities and educational institutions suddenly becomes very prominent. And in a whole other riff, which I won't uh, uh, expose you to today, um, this notion of learning over a continuing period of time is really important. So finding new ways of educating people is pretty critical. There have been a couple of exchanges uh, today and yesterday about YouTube and the place that a lot of young people go to to figure out how do I do X for some value of X. And I used to poo-poo this until one weekend my wife and I wanted to make Chinese eggplant and we didn't know how to do that. And so we went to YouTube and we said, how do you make Chinese eggplant? We got about, I don't know, 15 different videos showing you how to do it step by step. So we did. And we made a fairly credible Chinese eggplant. So I came away a believer in using online services for training, even for casual purposes, for you know, small, very specific things, as opposed to dropping everything and going back to school full time. If our, if our kid, you know, to learn how to make Chinese eggplant. So, so think about this for a moment. We have kids that are born today who will live to be 100 years old. There are implications of living to 100 years old. Let's assume you stay healthy. Your career might be 70 or 80 years long. You know, it used to be that you went to school, went to work, and retired. You, know, you learn a little, earn a little, retire. That paradigm doesn't work if you live to age 100, especially if you're going to be productive and active. Think about 2007, which is only 12 years ago. The iPhone shows up. Look at how many billions of devices have emerged over just 12 years and how dependent we are on that. Now imagine seven decades of technology development that you're going to live through as a productive member of the society, as a party who is working. The technology changes force us to learn new things, and we're going to have to learn how to deliver that more or less while you're working. So now it's going to be learn a while, earn a while, learn a while, earn a while, learn, then you can retire. So we have a, a significant responsibility to the extent that we're engaged in building and developing these devices. Either we are going to invent a utopia for everybody or it's gonna be a new global nightmare and it's our responsibility to make sure that it's the former and not the latter. Thank you very much. So we have time, I think we have time for Q&A. Is that correct? All right, so I have this microphone and already Al Romeg and you're number two over there. Don't forget your number. Yeah, Ben, I think it would probably not be a bad assumption that virtually everyone in this room has been hacked with a, you know, a bank, bank attack or credit card or social media or whatever it would, would be. So if you sit here under the assumption that you've been hacked and somebody has names, social, et cetera, et cetera, what do you do about it? <clears throat> well, let's see. You could change your name. Uh, you can, uh, that's a tough one because if, uh, if all it takes is that information to create a new account, so one of the hardest and worst problems is uh, identity theft, basically, where somebody can pretend to be you. Some people have suggested, oh, we need biometrics as a strong way of authenticating yourself. I worry about that as a literally a, a naked way of doing uh, identi identification. And here's why. Um, imagine, for example, it's fingerprints. Now, you know how these fingerprint readers work. They scan the fingerprint and then they digitize it. So they boil it down to some couple thousand bits of information and those bits eventually go into the system, get matched to the database and it says, yep, that's your fingerprint. Let's suppose that you are able to capture that particular digital representation of your fingerprint and you find a way to feed it into the system past the fingerprint reader. And now I'm you. And you can't do a thing about it. You could cut your finger off. That doesn't help very much. 
can't replace your fingerprints. So if we're going to use biometrics, we better use them in combination with something else, a cryptographically random thing. That's why two-factor authentication for me is very important. I don't think that your fingerprint or your eye scan is the second factor. That's a factor. Second factor, cryptographically generated thing. Now, at Google, we require all of our employees to use a second cryptographic factor. This is a little RFID NFC device, but it's deeper than generating a random number cryptographically. This thing engages in a Diffie-Hellman exchange between the source machine that you're you know, working on, your laptop, your mobile, and the edge device that you're talking to at the other end in our cloud. And it's an end-to-end -end cryptographically protected question. I see you have that microphone there. Don't give that to anybody because he's number two, okay? Um, I, you know, we've got two microphones causing ambiguity and who's in charge. I'm in charge. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I don't get to say that very often. Right? So, so let's use two-factor authentication. Now, there's a, there's a downside to this proposal. I have about 300 accounts uh, on the Internet. You know, and if I had to have a second dongle for each account, you know, I'd have this giant bag full of things that I have to carry around in order to authenticate myself. So the engineering challenge is design a two-factor authentication device that can have at least a couple of hundred uh, uh, private and public keys in it so I can select the one that's needed for a particular thing. So that's, honestly, that's my answer to that question. Number two over here. Wait, 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 you gotta use the microphone, otherwise, you won't be caught on the camera, and this is uh, plausible denial is not allowed. Ron. So uh, I liked what you talked about early on about the systems view of these things, looking at them as a system. There's also the larger system of our society that they're yes. embedded in, and of course we've seen you know, election fraud and so forth, or election manipulation with you know, technology as a part yep. of that. How do you think about uh, this notion of the collision of this technology and our society? Yeah, that's a Really, really good question. It's an important one, too, so thank you for asking it. Um, I don't have pixie dust to uh, you know, spread on there. Um, the, the specific thing that you're alluding to, of course, is the use of social media, for example, to influence people's thinking about and decision-making and the like. That's one angle. Another angle is using machine learning to make autonomous decisions, not about driving around, but do you or do you not get a loan from the bank? Do you get uh, released from, from prison, for example, uh, early or not? We have br uh, brittleness in the machine learning world. But let me take the social media question. The first thing I have to say is that the tool that we have that's the most effective at dealing with this is the wetware that's up here. It's called critical thinking. Now, I think children should be taught how to think critically about what they see and hear. Um, and it's not just on the internet. You can be misled by newspapers, magazines, television, radio, you know, your friends and your parents. Uh, there are some people who are very unhappy with my argument for critical thinking. You know, kids come home and they start questioning their parents' point of view and their opinions, and some parents don't like that. But from my point of view, teaching people to think critically is going to be important for the rest of their lives. It has been. This is not new. And so you should be asking questions like, where did this information come from? Is there any corroborating evidence that supports this argument? Who put this information up there? Are they trying to convince me to do something or decide something that I don't necessarily want to agree with? So all of those are natural questions that we should be asking ourselves. What's wrong with this picture? It takes work. You actually have to work. And when people come to me and they ask questions along these lines, I keep thinking, okay, look, here we have this internet, we have a World Wide Web sitting on top of it, we have this unbelievable amount of information out there. Some of it's dead wrong, some of it's deliberately wrong, some of it's wrong out of ignorance, some of it is scientifically proven data which later turned out to be wrong. Uh, and by the way, just to, to give you a sense for frustration, um, imagine that you're a scientist and you have this pet theory. And then, but you're a good scientist and so you have better measurement tools, you run an experiment to find out whether your theory still works and you get results that show perfect alignment except for this point over here. 
There are two kinds of scientists. Scientist number one says, eh, must be measurement error. Fits the rest of my theory. I'm good. The other guy says, huh, that's funny. That's the guy that gets the Nobel Prize when he figures out why that point is on the graph. The trouble we have is that as scientists, we say, look, here, to the best of our ability, you should do X. And that's what we figured out 20 years ago, do X. Yesterday, I ran another experiment to you know, large scale you know, uh, evaluation, and I discovered that X is actually the wrong thing to do. What you should really do is Y. Now, some of you will receive that information and say, you lied to me. And you say, no, I didn't lie to you. I gave you, to the best of my ability, the best information I had at the time. I have better information, I have better measurements, and now Y is the correct answer, not X. Some people will never forgive you for saying X. And that's a serious problem we have as professionals, as scientists and engineers, when we adhere to our belief that we should give the public the best, to the best of our ability, the best advice we have now we will run into the, you gave me bad advice before. And we have to find a way to help people think their way through that, as opposed to deciding you can't trust scientists and engineers. Not a good outcome. Okay, now where's number three? Over here. This is the last question, thanks. Ah. Serves me right, there we go. Where do you see or if you do see blockchain fitting into all this. Oh, I love this. <laughs> this, this is not a plant. She did, I didn't ask her to ask that question, but I'm so glad you did. Okay, first answer. Uh, if you're messing around with Bitcoin, run the other way. <laughs> it's a terrible idea. Uh, there isn't anything intrinsically valuable about these uh, uh, cryptocurrencies. And so I, I have a very dim view of that in case you didn't just notice. With regard to blockchain, uh, it's a really interesting idea. Uh, it has some um, weaknesses in it. There's a, I think in the March issue of CACM, I think, or possibly a later one, there is an article about blockchain strengths and weaknesses. The primary weakness, as I see it, is that the uh, rate at which a, I'm, I'm assuming people here have a sort of a fuzzy idea of how blockchain works. So forming the next block and figuring out who signs it to build this chain of blocks that are connected with each other cryptographically, finding who signs the next block is a, uh, it's fr it has friction. You have to figure out which of the many parties participating in the blockchain will do that. In the case of Bit Bitcoin, there's this computational challenge called proof of work, which uh, has led to, um, you know, massive consumption of electricity, the creation of specialized chips in order to perform a particular cryptographic calculation over and over and over again until you finally get a result that lets you win the proof of work contest. It's a terrible uh, price to pay. There's a, another thing called proof of stake, which is less computationally intensive. Uh, but with regard to blockchain in particular, for certain, certain things of reasonable scale blockchain is probably okay. We use it, in fact, at Google for some small applications. But it may not scale very well in terms of rate of transactions because of the uh, time it takes to form the next block. So uh, I would be cautious about blockchain. It is not the solution to all the world's problems. It will not you know, grow hair on my head or do anything else uh, like that. Uh, so be cautious about its use. It looks like I'm being told where I'm running out of time. Can I do I have time for one more question or not? Uh, I, someone said it was the last question. So. Okay, the real answer is not the question, it's the answer how, and how long it takes. Okay, so who has the last question? There it is, way in the back. There we go. Uh, so my question is hey, that... I saw you on the video. Oh, actually, yeah, it's, uh, so... Oh, uh, it's probably someone looks very similar. So actually, most of the, yeah, like I think our department always like even our colleagues sometimes confuse 
like two different new female professors here. So um, my question is that most of IoT devices we currently use are actually very cheap. They are much cheaper than smartphones or laptops. So lots of these manufacturers, they just don't have the capability to actually design all the good features that you talk about. So how could we help or like how could we change this situation? Okay. Well, first of all, it should not be an acceptable excuse that somebody says it costs too much to provide the, uh, the, those desirable properties that I listed. That's not an excuse. It costs too much, bad answer. So how do we deal with that? Well, one possibility is that we drive the cost of the computing devices down until it's affordable. The second answer is we design and build an ecosystem so that those deficient devices get protection from some other means. That might be, for example, a firewall or a hub or some other thing, which intervenes between the device and the rest of the world, the rest of the hostile world. And so I would charge those companies that say, it costs me too much to do these things, to say, if you try to sell that stuff, then you had better outline how it fits into a more protective ecosystem, how it, you know, how it interworks with that system so that the device can't be used in malicious ways. And I'm, I can easily imagine a regulatory stance, which by the way, Senator Warner has put on the table as a bill in the Senate with regard to US government use of IoT to say those IoT devices have to meet certain uh, constraints and restrictions and characteristics somehow. And whether the device does it on its own or it does it in the context of a larger ecosystem doesn't matter as much as the uh, desirable properties are met. And so I will accept the idea of a regulatory stance that says you can't sell those things into this market. Could I just say one example of this? Uh, seat belts were not common on cars until, I guess, maybe the 1950s or so. And you'll notice how they finally became standard and required. The first thing that the government said was, dear Mr. Automobile Maker, you are not making and selling another car in this country without a seat belt. Then we went over here and we said, ah, dear Mr. Driver, if we catch you driving your car without the seat belt on, there will be consequences. And so we built into the technology a framework of legal enforcement. That may be what we have to do with IoT and cyber physical systems. And there, I now hand this back to you. Thank you very much. So, so we have a, a little gift for you. Oh, do you need you. one, two hands for this? Okay. <laughs> And, wow, and, and, oh my God, this sounds like it might, okay. is it gurgling? No, no. <laughs> no, okay. All right, well, thank, thank you, you very much, much again, I appreciate and that. thanks for coming. Okay, yeah. well, I'll be here for the day, so Great. you can't get rid of me that easy. <laughs> and we're going to transition uh, directly into the security panel. I hope they have answers. <laughs> <laughs>